some water first. Mm. <laughs> so no, Wentworth and I are both rather nervous about this. Yes. <laughs> it's both our first times. So. We're on the same page. <laughs> so I wanted to start with the fact that, as you were saying, you were born not far away from here at Chip in Chipping Norton. Your father was a Rhodes Scholar. Mm. Do you feel a connection to the UK, to Oxford, coming back? How does it feel? I do. It's, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it's, my, it's my real pleasure to be here. It does feel like a homecoming of sorts, which is strange because I have no recollection of Oxford whatsoever. Um, my family left when I was uh, one. We moved back to the States. Um, but I do, feel, I do feel like I have roots here. Going on to your family then, your father was a Rhodes Scholar and on your Wikipedia page it says how many different countries you have ancestry to. What was it like growing up in something like that? Do you feel connection, do you feel cultured in a way because mm. of that? Right into race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do, I feel, I feel honored to have um, a variety of ancestries that I can think about and call on when I need to. I have, I have ancestors who were slaves in the American South. I have ancestors who were coal miners in the, uh, in the small towns throughout Pennsylvania. And there have been times in my life when I have needed to draw on some reserve of, of courage and endurance and perseverance and the thought of what my family has gone through, um, their various struggles and achievements, what they've overcome, um, the mere fact that I exist because they persevered uh, has given me strength. And how does that relate to your career then? Have you been able to draw on aspects of that in particular roles? Have you, has you been able to be a transition from your personal life to your professional life, I guess? Uh, it's a complicated question with a lot of moving parts. Um, I feel as though there is a parallel between uh, who I am as a person and the road that I've walked and the parts that I've been able to play. I think Michael Schofield, for example, on Prison Break, um, part of his appeal is that he is, uh, he's an escape artist, he's a survivor. He's someone who has been through extreme circumstances, and I think that to, to watch him on his journey, um, to see him constantly turning straw into gold is uh, inspiring. It's something that everyone can relate to in their own way, and it's cer certainly something that, that I can relate to, to personally. Mm. So perhaps you could tell us then a little bit more about your creative process and the artistic process with which you approach each role. Uh, it's kind of a hodgepodge. I studied at a variety of different, uh, different schools. Um, I think in the end, uh, an actor has to find what works for them. For me, uh, I do look for a personal connection with the character. How can I relate to the circumstances in which they find themselves? Um, it's, also about, it's also about archetype. Um, Storytelling is a centuries-old tradition, and there's uh, the warrior archetype, the magician archetype, the king archetype, the lover archetype, figuring out um, which one of those my character resonates with most strongly and tapping into that in whatever way that looks like. And sometimes that might be a song, that might be a piece of art, uh, that might be a photograph from my own childhood, something that um, makes me feel connected to the character on a personal level. That, I guess, does that kind of tie into, so you did an English literature major at Princeton, does that, do you feel that that was a good grounding for then what you have put to your career? Yeah. I think so. I think um, having read a lot of books and written about a lot of books uh, throughout my college career, uh, analyzing a text, um, investigating character and theme and dialogue, all of that comes into play when I'm uh, sitting with a script and trying to familiarize myself with uh, the part that I've been cast in, sure. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Because Oxford is full of aspiring actors and actresses. Mm. What would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? 
I think you want to go in and not necessarily not necessarily play what you think they're hoping to see, but play your best version of the character. Um, the advice I got once upon a time was don't read the breakdowns. There's something in the United States where when they're casting for a movie or for a TV show, they will provide uh, what's called the breakdowns and they have a list of the characters that they're looking to cast with a description of each character. And sometimes it will literally say, we're looking for a young Tom Hanks. And if you're a young Tom Hanks, then the part is probably yours. Like, go get it. If you're a young John Malkovich, then it might not be the right fit. So if you go in and you're a young John Malkovich and you do your best young Tom Hanks impersonation, you're not gonna get the part. And not only are you not gonna get the part, but they're gonna think, wow, that guy is back to class maybe. Um, what you want to do is go in and show them your best young John Malkovich, even if it's not right for the part, because you won't get that part because that's not what they're looking for, but they will remember, wow, that was a fantastic young John Malkovich. I'll keep that, I'll keep that guy in mind for next time. So that's kind of, I guess, then relates to your role in The Human Stain, where you were, I guess, a young Anthony Hopkins, in a way. What was that like? Uh, what was gratifying about that experience was I didn't have to particularly worry about being a young Anthony Hopkins. We actually shot my part of the movie first, which was set back in the 1950s. And then he went and watched those dailies, so he actually modeled himself after me, which I found um, flattering, to say the least. <laughs> so, I suppose that kind of leads on to then some of your other roles as you're breaking through kind of before Prison Break. What stuck out to you? What was it like trying to get into the world of Hollywood acting? One more time. So, so <laughs> can you tell us basically a little bit about your first roles, kind of the pre-Prison Break, the Mm. how you managed to become the actor that you are today? Well, I think what I went through was a process of trial and error. Uh, I think for a long time I was a young John Malkovich trying to be a young Tom Hanks. I was trying to um, fit my myself into a, a round hole um, when I was, in fact, a, a square peg. Uh, I used to walk into auditions and treat them like job interviews. Um, especially right after college, like, hey, how are you? Uh, I'm the guy for the job. I, I will memorize all my lines. I'll show up on time. That's not necessarily what they're wanting to see. What they're wanting to see is you, what you have to bring to the table that's unique, that's interesting, um, that's edgy. Uh, it took me a long time to understand that the audition process is about walking into a room full of strangers, unzipping and vomiting out your most private self. And then when the audition is done, you zip up and you go. That is the job. That is the, the working definition of a professional. If someone had explained it to me in those terms when I first graduated, when I was thinking of an audition as a job interview scenario, um, I would have quit acting. It would have been too frightening to me. Uh, so the process of working my way up the ladder in Hollywood from co-star to guest star to series regular to series lead uh, dovetailed and had everything to do with me getting more and more comfortable with showing up as I really was in a variety of situations. Did you feel in those years that you had much agency over the roles you were doing that you could be part of creating the character and making it your own or did you feel like it was put upon you I guess? Uh, like I said, I, I was trying to, to, to fit myself into these containers um, into which I, I, I didn't necessarily fit easily. The fact is, um, Hollywood was not writing roles for openly gay men of mixed race. Um, they still aren't to a certain degree, so I was having to choose from what was available and then work to, to make myself fit. Uh, a pivotal switch for me in my thinking about the audition process and my casting in Hollywood was someone explaining to me that 
Your average actor walks into these situations, into a casting, like they're a guest at a dinner party, and they're afraid to track shit in on the carpet. Um, it's the reverse. You have to, to assume the role of host, and what you're hosting them to is you. So eventually, when I had the confidence and an increased sense of who I was and what I had to offer as a man and as an artist, regardless of the role, regardless of what they were looking to cast, I would just tailor it to me. I would make it my own. I suppose that leads on quite nicely then to the thing that, whilst I've been researching, has really struck me about you, and that is your complete confidence in your own identity and who you are and the fact that as an openly gay person in Hollywood, being open about the very struggles you faced and the challenges that that brings. Could, I guess, just tell us a little bit about that and how you've come to be in this position where you can speak so openly. Well, first, let's unpack that confidence piece. <laughs> uh, right now, for example, I am, I am really nervous. <laughs> so it's, it's, for me, it's a both and. It's, it's confidence and I'm also terrified. Um, I think of myself as a warrior, but I'm also uh, vulnerable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, it's good for me to check in with myself and how I'm feeling physically. Like right now, for example, uh, as I acknowledged, I am feeling uh, some nervousness, some, some anxiousness, uh, a desire to please. Um, some pressure to be perfect, uh, some pressure to speak beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay, because I'm constantly, moment by moment, reminding myself that none of that is necessary. Um, I can show up, I am free to show up in, in whatever way I find myself, like how I am is perfect, flaws and all. If what I say resonates with no one, that's fine. If what I say resonates with one person, beautiful. Um, it's a constant kind of balance between uh, openness and guardedness, confidence and vulnerability. It's not easy, but it reaffirms my sense of what balance is. I used to hear that word and I would think of this kind of zen-like surrendered state. Oh, I'm, I'm balanced now. But what balance is, is more like a tightrope walker where you're constantly having to make little adjustments so that you don't topple over one way or the other. That, to me, is my new working definition of balance. And that allows me to be okay with, I am speaking, this is my truth, there is beauty in being self-expressed, and it's also terrifying. It's rewarding, and I'm also regretting having come today. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's all of the mm -hmm. above. I think, it's all of the above. I think that people definitely feel with you is the fact that because you can be so open about how you're feeling in such a like, natural and honest way, it is just reassuring for everyone else to know that, okay, it's okay that I'm also really terrified. And I also think I might stumble over my words because a sense of being in it together and a sense of creating a positive dialogue, I suppose. Yes, and we are in it together. I, <laughs> you and me in the trenches. I, I look back on a period of my life when I was in college specifically and the idea of uh, sitting in this room full of strangers and talking about depression, talking about suicide. I just could not have dreamt of such a thing. It would have filled me with, with fear. Um, but I now feel as though because I'm willing to speak to these things, I'm also having to work a lot less harder than some people here. Because it's one thing to be depressed or have to deal with anxiety. It's another to also have to work to cover that constantly. And I spent a great deal of my life pouring a lot of time and energy into covering, into, into pretending that everything was fine. And now I don't have to do that. Like that time and energy I can now put somewhere else. And that's been huge for me personally and creatively. I think that is a really powerful thing because in Oxford, I don't know if you know, but an estimated 50% of students at some point during their degree will have troubles with mental health. And I think in my opinion, having a dialogue about it helps people and 
I guess you being able to say this to everyone must be really reassuring and I know I'm not the only one to think that and I think what would you how would you say to people that you can get to this position where you're happy with yourself for mm. you what has been the process uh, to go back to that straw into gold model um, which I think of as you know an alchemical process where we take something that is dark and edgy um, our secret shames, the things we don't want anyone to know, and then we make that um, a strength, something that uh, sets us apart, something that makes our story uh, resonant and worth telling. I had an acting coach who used to give lectures before every class, that was his style, hashtag acting coach. Um, and he, he said to us one day, all right, who here wants to be a star? And we all raised our hands, that way. that's why we were there on a Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. And he said, great, I want you to go home and make a list of everything in your life that you are ashamed of, that you would absolutely die if anyone else found out. Just write it all down from your thoughts about your, your physicality to that time you kicked the family dog, just list it, list it all. That's your first list, things I don't want people to know. And then the second list, Title that, Things That Are Going To Make Me A Star. And then you take everything from the first list and you slide it over to the second. Because that's what we want to see when we go to the theater. And that's what we want to see when we turn on the TV. That's what we want to see when we go to the movies. We want, we want to see other people being honest about what the human experience is. And that's not where I came from. In college, I remember a very competitive environment. I remember um, being reminded constantly that I was now among the best and the brightest. And it just, it just sucked the air right out of it. It felt, it felt like there was very little room for error in that model, uh, that any sign of, of vulnerability would be perceived as a weakness. So when I did find myself in crisis, and I spent a lot of my college years in crisis, uh, I, didn't turn, I didn't turn to anyone for help as soon as I could have, as often as I could have, because of that, because of that fear. Um, and that's something that I'm actively looking to get out of my life, gently, peacefully, thoughtfully. Yeah, I think more than anything that's got to resonate with the people here today, the students that have come to hear you talk about things so empirically. So I think now is probably a good time to open to some questions from the audience. Great. So, if we go to the gentleman on the front in the middle. Now, thank you so much for that. Um, just curious to know, what does happiness mean to you? Happiness. Uh, that's a great question. Um, especially in the States, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on happiness and how can you achieve happiness. For me, happiness does not seem like a particularly realistic goal. I set my sights on being content. And then if I happen to experience happiness, great. Um, one of the things that I've done recently is I've started to pay attention to when I'm experiencing joy because it comes and goes so quickly. Um, where was I? What was I listening to? Who was I with? What was I eating? Um, these are things that are necessary to note so that when you are struggling, um, when you are not in a place of joy, you can work to recreate those moments using some of those tools in your tool belt. Wonderful. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, if you go to the first row. Um, I really enjoyed reading your screenplays that you recently made available, the Stoker and the Uncle Charlie Thank ones. You. And I was wondering whether you were planning on doing more of that with your career or whether you wanted to go back and focus on the acting side. Uh, I'm not sure what the future holds for me at this point, as a writer or as an actor. Um, before, acting was one of the few places where I, I could express how I felt. I could get my rage out, I could get my grief out. Um, now I do that in other places. Um, the same with my writing. Originally it was about screenplays, um, all of which are uh, 
autobiographical to a certain degree, but with this safety net that looked like, oh, it's a fictional story with fictional characters, but I'm really layering in a lot of like my own shit. Now, <laughs> now it's more about um, personal essays, which I, I post on, on Facebook, um, talking about the things that are real and true for me. Um, I, see, I see more of that in the future. I'm not ruling out another screenplay. I'm not ruling out another role beyond Prison Break. But um, finding different ways of being self-expressed and telling my own story, whatever that looks like, uh, that's, that's what's next for me. Yeah. If we go to on the first row over here. You were talking about your depression, and I obviously know that you've been through your whole career, and like you're not the youngest person anymore. Not in a rude way, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How were you able to overcome all that stuff? Because I know that it's very difficult, and you're still here. Yes, I am still here. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean that as a joke. I mean that as, as an affirmation. Um, Depression is not, unfortunately, one size fits all, fortunately or unfortunately. I don't want to assign a value to it. Um, it looks different for everyone. Um, sometimes it's chemical, sometimes it's biological. Um, it can be environmental. Um, so what works for one person might not necessarily work for the next. What I will say is that um, self-expression is huge. Having a, a container in which to put what is boiling up inside of you, your, your, your anger, your fear, your guilt, your shame, um, finding ways to get that out. Maybe it's on paper, maybe it's on a canvas, maybe it's a, a jog around the school track. Just get it out of you. As soon as it bubbles up, work to get it out. Um, another thing is self-care. Just moments where I am doing what I need to do to make sure that I vibrate at the right frequency. That might look like uh, burning some sage. That might look like dinner out with a friend. It might look like uh, a bath with Epsom salts. Just the things that I need to do for myself that are small, doable, um, affordable, that, um, that, that nourish me. Um, I think often we, we neglect ourselves. We focus on things in the external, but there's a lot here that needs, that needs attention. Uh, the other thing I would do is to make sure that you are talking to yourself in a way that is loving and supportive. Uh, it became clear to me at a certain point in my life, I've had, I've had friendships. I've been, <laughs> I've been a good friend to people, and when a friend is in crisis, I know how to be there for them. I know how to hold uh, a space that looks like listening. Um, it looks like support. It looks like a back and forth. Maybe it just looks like a hug. Maybe it looks like being silent and just holding their hand. I know how to do that for a friend. I realize that when I am in crisis, when I have quote unquote fucked up, my response is, you fucking idiot. You know, um, how could you, of course, what did you expect? If I spoke to my friends like I used to speak to myself, I would have no friends. So what I started to pay attention to was how I spoke to myself out loud and in my head. And in your head is a much more difficult conversation, but you can, uh, I think, I judge, um, control the words that come out of your mouth. So. If you do talk to yourself out loud, and I do, make sure that the words are loving and supportive and nourishing. Start the work of being your own best friend. Next question. If we go to on the front row, the glasses. You sort of touched on it just then, um, talking about how um, you have through your experiences been able to support other people and like mental health as Fran said is quite a big issue in Oxford and not only is it sort of like taking care of yourself but it's also um, to how to take care of other people and so I was wondering if you should have given insight on the best way you, through your experiences you found to, it uh, to support other people who are depressed or going through anxiety and stuff. 
So yeah, question. that's an excellent question um, and one that a lot of people wrestle with. Um, there are a lot of people who know someone in crisis, but they're not sure what to say. Maybe they're worried about saying the wrong thing. Um, my suggestion would be to start there. Approach that person and say, I don't know what to say, and I'm worried about saying the wrong thing, but I see you. I feel like something's going on. I want you to know that I'm here for you. Um, if you need support, I can offer you that. You tell me what that looks like. And that way you've acknowledged that you're unsure, you don't know what to do or say. You've acknowledged that you see them, they, felt seen, they feel seen, they, they feel heard and acknowledged, which is huge for someone who's in crisis. Often people uh, will turn a blind eye out of fear. Um, they uh, will just hope that that person kind of fixes themselves and, you know, I hope you pull your, yourself together and then come back to us when you're, when you're fine. Um, but it also starts a dialogue, and that's important. And then once you're dialoguing with that person, once they feel like they have your support, and once you've given them ownership of the conversation by saying to them, you tell me what support looks like, it allows them to feel like they are to a degree in charge of what's going on with them, like they get to make decisions, which might be a new experience for them in depression, in anxiety. Um, then you can start to explore what other resources are available. Maybe there's something at the Student Health Center. Maybe the administration has something in place. Maybe there's a peer-to-peer uh, -peer counseling support group on campus. And if there isn't, how do we get that started? Okay, so if we go to you right at the back in the orange t-shirt. Hello. Uh, firstly, thank you for coming out here tonight. And my question is that, as an actor, you portray, uh, play so many different roles over your career. And uh, uh, since you mentioned that there is somewhat honesty in the roles you play, so at some point you have to convince yourself of the emotions that you portray in these roles. So, uh, as I see it, that there is, it's easy to lose the sense of self between what is real and uh, what you're playing as a character on the screen, right? So how do you maintain this balance in real life? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. A lot of moving parts. Um, how do I distinguish between what is real and what is not? Um, sometimes it's not easy because that is what I'm getting paid to do, to bring truth to a situation that is a lie. Um, to, to lie well or to lie as honestly as I can is, is my job as an actor from a certain perspective. Um, when I'm playing a scene in Prison Break and I'm Michael Schofield and I'm having to rage at someone or grieve um, or, or conjure up fear, uh, I will draw on my own experiences. Um, and over the course of X number of takes, because you know, they'll put the camera in different places and they'll shoot your coverage, they'll shoot your scene partner's coverage. If the scene is me getting throttled, um, I'll have to be throttled 30 or 40 times. And at a certain point, my body starts to believe that I'm actually being throttled because I'm selling the reality of that situation. Um, I don't remember in acting class anyone ever teaching me about what happens when you're done with the scene and they send you home for the day and that that thing is still in you, that, oh, I just spent the last three hours being throttled. Now that ties in with my sense of um, how important it is to, to self-care. So when I've done a particularly intense scene, when my body may believe that what I just shot is true and I have to sort of bring myself back to center, um, I'll go for a walk, I'll, I'll meet up with a friend, I'll watch uh, a movie that I know makes me laugh. I'll engage in the things that will bring me back to myself, that will calm myself down, and which keep me safe, ultimately. Thank you for your question. If we go to um, here. Basically, I'm nervous like you. And um, I have two questions. First, regarding to the gentleman question about happiness. I always judge the people by one question. Does the money bring happiness for you? Does what? Does the money bring happiness for you? Does the money you? bring happiness? Yes. <laughs> and second question, uh, I'm really keen and eager to know your stand for American election. 
whether we are with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Mm. <laughs> uh, the money does not bring happiness. That's, that's my answer to that question. Um, the money can take care of a lot. Uh, the money can handle certain things. Does it bring uh, a sense of self-worth? No. Does it bring a sense of uh, self-satisfaction? No. In fact, um, it's, it's easy to, to feel a sense of, of letdown, uh, of, of betrayal, because I was raised to, to glamorize Hollywood as were we all, to think of it as fame and fortune and parties, and that once I got a taste of that, everything would be fine. And then I discovered that uh, it wasn't fine, actually. Um, it, even, it even highlighted all of the ways that it was not fine. As far as the election, uh, <laughs> there's only one question that I am, that I, that I'm asking myself, that I have been asking myself, and it's, can she do the job? And the answer is yes. So I just take it back to your earlier question when we were talking about money not bringing happiness and it being the small things, and that for me made, <coughs> reminded me when you were talking about just like taking a bath and the small things in that. And I guess that's a nice leveler because I think it's easy for people to think oh, you've got money so you can get all this treat, all the things that you need. And I think, I think that's quite resonating with people, that small things that you don't necessarily think about because in our hectic lives, it's about taking a breather, I guess. And have you found, I don't know, is it easy to take a step back? Do you have to force yourself to self-care? I don't, well, for me, um, I had to, to, to train myself to think about it because it wasn't a part of my natural day. My, my natural day was about getting things done, what's next. Uh, in college, it was that quiz, that test, that exam, uh, that lecture, that meeting, that party. Um, it was constantly uh, focusing on things outside myself. Now, I do remind myself to take a breath, and I do remind myself that what I need to self-care is readily available. A day at the spa will stress me out. I, I, don't, I don't find that to be a relaxing experience. I would much prefer to sit down on a bench for five minutes. I've walked around the campus. I've seen a few benches. Those things are available to you. Um, they might not work for you in the same way that they work for me, but to sit down, to take a breath, to take a moment, even if it's for five minutes, for me makes a world of difference. If we go um, over here with the red coat. Hi, nice to meet you, Went. The Mankind Project, mm. tell me about that and how did it resonate with you to get you to the place where you are today? Mankind Project, um, that's an organization that I'm a part of in the States. It was founded about 30 years ago, and it's uh, men supporting other men doing what they call men's work. For me, that meant, which was a new and initially terrifying experience, sitting with a circle of men and sharing myself honestly. For two years, every Monday night from 7 to 10 o'clock, I would meet with six or ten men and we would talk about our, our day, our lives, what was up for us, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the incredibly ugly. And it was, it was a, an intentionally sacred space. Whatever you shared there was meant to stay there. And it did many things for me. Um, it'd be hard to encapsulate in the time that we have. One of them was that it felt as though, because there's an, uh, a built-in initiation process, um, as you're introduced to the Mankind Project and, and as you're allowed to kind of sit with these men and share in this way, um, it felt like for the first time in my life I was tasting what I'd never tasted before, not, not in the Western world, which was an uh, initiation process. Um, I think maybe if you're going through a, a bar mitzvah, that speaks to this process to a degree, but Speaking for myself, I, did never, I, ne I never had uh, a moment where at 12, at 13, uh, the village elder came to me and said, today 
you are a man. Come and sit by the fire with your elders and hear the wisdom of the ages. Um, let us model for you what it is to be a man, how a man walks, how a man talks. I didn't get that education. So like a lot of men, I was, I was left to make it up on my own, um, which <laughs> resulted in a very mixed bag. It, it resulted in me feeling at 40 like I was a man boy still and hanging out in that gray space. So to sit with these men, some of whom were in their 80s, from all walks of life, to hear their stories, to vibrate with that energy, and to feel supported in turn was uh, revolutionary for me. And it was the first place that I outed myself uh, publicly. I'd been outing myself as a gay man privately to family and friends for years prior, but that was the first community into which I walked and said, I am a gay man. And the response was, great, have a seat. And that was it. And that was tremendous to not have them make this big deal out of it, to not assign that, um, this, this weighty value uh, that I'd been assigning it myself for years. And just to be completely honest with it yourself, I guess, in a way that wasn't yeah. pressured. To find a space where you feel like you have permission to be authentic um, is, is precious. And we don't get that necessarily with even friends and, and with even friends and family. Um, there was a reason that the men in the Mankind Project call each other brothers, not friends, because a brother will tell you something that a friend will not. On the front row here. So you talked before about uh, the, the things that you wouldn't tell anyone and how those would make you uh, famous. And so essentially putting yourself out there. My question would be, how do you deal with the criticism, the harsh criticism, or rather the hatred by the public on those things that you wouldn't share? Am I hated? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, well, <laughs> acting provides me a safe and structured container in which I get to put all of those things that we're talking about. So when I'm playing Michael Schofield, for example, and he's having to, um, to get what he wants from someone, and it looks like tears, it looks like screaming, it looks like a wrestling match, um, none of the words that he's saying are mine, necessarily. And the emotions that I'm pouring into that no one's going to know where those are coming from, necessarily. No one's going to know that I'm referencing that specific thing in my childhood, that time that I experienced humiliation and fear and doubt that I'm now bringing to this scene. No one will ever get that as an audience member. What they'll get is that Michael's going through something and it resonates as true. It feels like there's some, um, there's some juice here. That's what I mean. So uh, acting provides me um, a safe space in which to share myself, um, but it doesn't look like uh, me writing an autobiography necessarily. But it is me, but it's not. But it's me, but it's not. I feel like when you were talking about the essays you've been writing, mm -hmm. that then kind of is blurring that boundary then. If you're using personal experiences in your safe spaces of acting, but then actually kind of breaking that down a little bit through yourself and through what you're writing. How was that process? How did you feel about, I guess, putting your cards on the table mm. in a way that previously been wrapped up in a performance? It's cathartic. It is always cathartic. Um, there was uh, an opportunity to reply to a meme that went around not too long ago. Um, I saw it come up in my uh, social media feed a couple of times. It struck me, it upset me, and then I did the work of getting that out, and I put it down on a piece of paper. I decided to post that, it wound up on Facebook, and then it went um, to a lot of different places, and it spoke to a lot of people about different things, suicide, depression, um, body issues, fat shaming. And A, I was able to get it out of me, which felt good. And then I was also able to see that 
my process of self-expression, which is inherently, I think, self-centered, and I use that phrase in a positive way, can also be of service to others because I was able to put something into words that a lot of people could relate to, but wouldn't necessarily speak to themselves for whatever reason. Um, and that was, that was heartening. That gave me encouragement that when I go to those places and acknowledge, this is hard for me, this is fearful for me, this is a place where I, I feel shame, um, I am going to those places that everyone would want to go to if we had permission, which ties back concretely for me to what it is to be an actor. Uh, one of my coaches used to say that acting is it's considered a noble profession because an actor spends their lives running toward the experiences um, and the emotions that the average person spends their lives running away from. That's why it's so important that we have actors um, because through them and their sharing and their storytelling, we all get to experience collectively a kind of catharsis and transformation. So I guess, did you intend to be a role model through that? Did you know that that would be the effect? Uh, no, I never intend to be a role model. <laughs> I, think, I think if you approach people with that energy, I have something to teach you. Um, they immediately shut down, at least I would. So all I can do is offer up my example and hope that it resonates with someone. Um, I've got a Facebook page that I've been running for the last two years. It's public. Um, it's got a lot of likes. I post about uh, gender identity and um, suicide and a few personal essays. Very little, little of it is about something like Prison Break or Legends of Tomorrow. And I've been asked, how do I pick what I post? And I pick what I post um, because I, I want to reach two people, myself and someone else. That page exists to expand my own awareness. Um, to service my own education, and then I hope that someone out there who might not even press the like button, who might not ever comment, is also going to resonate with what it is I have to share and say. If we go to the lady on that, with the grey scarf. Um, I'm just curious, what is success for you, and if you can give uh, a piece of advice on how we can achieve it? Mm. Success and how to achieve it. Uh, success for me is feeling like I'm in alignment with myself. Um, alignment for me is what I think, is what I say, is what I do, as opposed to how I spent the first four decades of my life which was what I think is what I sometimes say, which is what I occasionally do. So when I'm able to get those things to line up, I feel like whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm experiencing, that is success. I'm sitting in my truth. I'm speaking to my truth. How to achieve that? Um, practice. Speaking your, your truth takes practice and forgiveness. Forgiving yourself for not getting it right, whatever that is, quote unquote. Forgiving yourself for not doing it beautifully. I remember in college, one of the messages I, one of the messages, messages I felt like I was sitting with was, um, do it beautifully or don't do it at all. And if, and if and when you do it beautifully, don't tell anyone what went into that. So if someone asks you, you know, did you study for that test, the answer is always no but you'd been studying for, th for three weeks or even three months prior, so when you got that A, it just looks easy. Um, that's bullshit <laughs> and <laughs> deeply unhelpful. So to practice forgiveness, to expand my definition of what right looks like so that I can work with that um, so I don't feel shame for putting myself out there, uh, forgiving myself for trying and having it not work out. All of these things are very important. I know someone who, for example, um, decided to go to law school and then after a few months thought, this is not for me. And they made what I thought was a very brave decision, which was to get out of that thing that they realized was not for them, as opposed to stay in it um, because of appearances. And I know other people who went to law school graduated, 
sitting on the other side are like, fuck, I hate the law. <laughs> but now I've got this degree and I've got student debt and I guess I got to see this thing out. And to hear them speak of their life in that way uh, makes me sad. That's, that's not a road that I would choose for myself. So don't be afraid to, to try and have it not work out. That's part of success. Wonderful. So I think we've got time for just one more question, um, very briefly. Um, if we go to, oh, there's so many people. How do I choose um, the front row there with the check scarf? Thank you for that. Um, so I come from a background where there's a stigma with saying you're depressed. So um, what are your views in terms of how um, to deal culturally or to create more awareness that actually depression is a disease? Mm. Uh, I think it depends on who you're talking to and what you feel might resonate most deeply with that person. Um, for example, there is uh, a video that I just did with uh, The Mighty. It's an organization that speaks to a variety of illnesses um, uh, and challenges up to and including mental health. And it was about um, uh, illustrating what depression can be like for some people. Just, just a taste. It's a three, four minute video. And I know that people um, appreciated that video because they were able to show it to their friends and families uh, and say, here, this is what that thing is. This, is. this is what I've been trying to put into words all of these years, um, because depression can be difficult to describe. I think it might be links, it might be videos, it might be conversations, it might be a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think the more people that speak about depression, um, I believe Bruce Springsteen has just written an autobiography where he speaks to depression's influence in his life. Uh, that expands people's sense, um, his audience, his fans, his readers, of what it is permissible to talk about. I think we have to be willing to talk about uncomfortable things, unspeakable things that remain unspoken. Um, that creates a wall of silence. And on the other side of that wall, people are suffering. So we have to be brave and in our own time and way, and in a way that feels safe for us, enter into these conversations and start breaking down stigma. And I think that's how it's done, by talking about it, by being open about it. When and if it feels safe and comfortable and right for you. Well, I think we're all leave feeling self-assured I guess and hopefully I've I've taken a lot from this and I do hope everyone else has and please do join me in thanking the wonderful Wentworth Miller. <laughs>